All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to continue our conversation about genetics, um, only we're going to get in a lot deeper. Um, the previous set of notes, that was about Mendelian genetics, kind of the seventh grade or junior high level of genetics. Mendel was a genius, but there's so much more we've learned about genetics since Mendel. Um, and so that's what we're going to start talking about today. Keep in mind that you could um, be a scientist who studies genetics, so we're just giving you 30 minutes of genetics. So there's so much more than we're going to imply here. So the big questions that we're still trying to answer, how are traits inherited and how are traits expressed? Now, let me give you a few suggestions for taking notes on this, this particular set of notes. And this is just part one of this Prezi. I'll do part two in a second set of notes because this is a really long Prezi. So let me just give you a suggestion for taking notes. I'm going to say that you should have a piece of paper that you have um, a table on. And the table is going to have um, the different types of um, uh, patterns of inheritance that we're going to be talking about right now. So you'll have pattern of inheritance on one side. In the middle, you'll describe, so description of that pattern of inheritance. And then in the third column, you'll give examples of that pattern of inheritance. And I think that would be a super way for you to organize your notes. So again, you're going to have the pattern of inheritance and then all the different types that I describe. You're going to describe the pattern of the inheritance. So what's a definition or, or how do you explain that pattern of inheritance. And then on the far side, you're going to have um, examples of that pattern. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about dominance. Um, Mendel led us to believe, and our discussion yesterday led us to believe that it's always dominant versus recessive. Well, it's so much more than that, um, but we'll talk about dominance right now. There's a couple more varieties of dominance that that Mendel didn't know anything about. So the first one is called incomplete dominance. Um, so you may remember from our discussion yesterday that that's actually historically what um, people believed that traits blended. And that's actually what's happening in incomplete dominance. But that's not the way it usually works. Um, so let me give you an example of incomplete dominance. You're going to have two dominant traits. And if the organism gets one of each of them, in other words, the organism is heterozygous, then there going to be a blending of the two dominant traits. So the example here are these carnations. Um, the gene, let's see if I can move my arrow so you can see it a little bit better. The gene down at the bottom for white is a dominant trait and it's signified with a capital W. The gene on the, oops, that was on the left, wasn't it? On the right, my right at least, I don't know. I can't tell when we're talking backwards like this. Okay, but the picture on the right um, is the red flower and it also has a dominant gene that's signified with a capital W. But if we bring those two flowers, if we mate those two flowers, um, we get offspring that are heterozygous. They have one of the capital W's and one of the capital R's. Um, and that actually leads to some white and some red and a blending to form a pink flower. So that is an, a, cir a circumstance of blending. It's interesting that in the diagram, I just saw this right now, the photos are of carnations. Snapdragons also show that type of dominance, but that's not the type of flower that they have in the picture here. Whatever. Um, so let's take a look. The question says, how does this alter ratios? So um, if this was normal dominance, um, like Mendel predicted, with a dominant red and a recessive white, then we would expect when we made the Punnett square, we would expect three quarters, 75% of the offspring to be red and 25% of the offspring to be white or vice versa. But that's that three to one ratio that we would get with a dominant and a recessive. However, what we get, if you look down at the bottom, we get only 25% showing red and 50% showing um, pink and then 25% showing white. The way you would show that ratio is a one to two to one ratio. Um, so that alters the genetic square or the Punnett square ratios. All right, the next one that we're going to talk about is called codominance. Codominance is similar to incomplete dominance in that you have two dominant traits, only this time instead of blending, both of the dominant traits show up. So a classic example of codominance occurs in blood types. Blood types are fun because blood types show codominance and they also show multiple alleles, which we're going to talk about next. So we're going to use blood types as two examples. So you may be familiar with blood types that humans can have type A, type B, type AB, or type O. 
well, what does that mean and where do those come from? So it turns out that the gene or the allele for um, type A blood produces a particular carbohydrate on the surface of the cell that scientists have just labeled with the very creative name A. Um, so anybody who has the who has inherited the type A allele has this particular carbohydrate. It's a it's a, an identifier even to white blood cells. They recognize that shape, um, that particular carbohydrate. And so you have the A carb on your um, or a person does on the, uh, the outside of their red blood cells. Anybody who inherits the B allele will have the B carbohydrate on the outside of their red blood cells. Anybody who inherits one from mom and one from dad, and I'm sorry, an A from mom and an A from dad or vice versa, is going to have both of them, not a blending, not some new carbohydrate. They're going to have both of them showing up. So they're going to have some of the A carbs and some of the B carbs. So if you take a look at the diagram, this is type A, and they only have the A shape. Here's type B, and they only have the B shape. Here's type AB, and they have both shapes on it. So that's an example of codominance. They both showed up. Now I'm going to continue on because we're about to talk about multiple alleles and we'll just keep sticking with um, blood types right now. So multiple alleles here, let me just jump ahead. I may as well give me a second here. Multiple alleles is when you have more than two choices for a gene. So for blood types, you could be type A. You have, you have an A allele. I got to say that better. There's a B allele. And then there's what we call the recessive O allele. So there we have more than two two choices instead of just the usual R and W or instead of just the usual big R and little R, we have three choices. So let's go back and take a look at those three choices again. Give me a second here. Okay. So if you are type O blood, that means that you inherited the recessive trait that leads to no carbohydrates on the surface of the cell. And so take a look, somebody who is homozygous recessive for type O blood has none of those identifying shapes on the outside of their um, red blood cells. Somebody who inherited one of the type O from one parent and then an A, say, from the other parent, so they are called heterozygous, they show just the A's on the outside. You can also be heterozygous for B, and that means you inherited a B and a type O. The, um, if you are heterozygous and you got an A and a B, then you are type AB, then you get both of them. So just a quick, because it's interesting, um, little background information about blood types and donating blood types. Um, remember that your red, your white blood cells are traveling around doing cell to cell communication where they actually touch cells in the area. And if they touch something that is foreign, they attack. So let's say I have type O blood and I get into a car accident and I'm bleeding and somebody donates type A blood to me. That's so nice. Except my white blood cells who should be busy repairing my injuries and helping me to fight off any infections from diseases that came in because of my injuries they're going to be obsessing over that type A blood and they're going to attack the type A blood and it's going to lead to clotting and all kinds of other issues and it's going to cause me to be more likely to die because my white blood cells are attacking the wrong blood type. So as a type O patient, the only blood type that I can receive that won't be rejected by my white blood cells is type O blood. But now let's totally flip that around. Let's say I'm type AB. My white blood cells are familiar with the A um, carbohydrate shape and they're familiar with the B carbohydrate shape. That is a huge advantage. What that means is that I can receive, if I get injured, I can receive type A blood. My white blood cells recognize it. I can receive type B blood my white blood cells recognize it, and I can receive type O blood because there's nothing to reject on the outside of type O blood, so my white blood cells accept it, and, and I could receive type AB blood. So I'm a universal recipient if I'm type AB blood. If I'm type O, I can only receive blood from people who have type O blood. However, 
blood banks really want my blood because I can donate to A, B, I can donate to B, I can donate to A, and of course I can donate to O. So I'm a universal donor. All right, moving on. That gives us kind of the background information of blood types that you really just should know. Okay, um, continuing on with the multiple alleles, trying to see if there's anything else we need to say. So this... Oh, that looked perfect. Okay, so um, how does this alter ratios? Again, um, we don't have that three to one ratio that you might expect with a typical um, monohybrid Punnett square. Um, so it's going to be totally impacted by um, whether somebody has heterozygous, whether they have type O blood. So the alleles, the ratios are not going to look at all the same. I'm just going to go with that. They're just going to look different. All right, and then moving on, there's such a thing as polygenic inheritance. So be careful because I think these two are super easy to mix up. I think it's easy to mix up um, incomplete and codominance. So incomplete dominance blends, codominance, they both show up. Then there are these two words, multiple allele and polygenic. Got to be really careful to understand the difference between the word allele and gene. An allele is a form of a gene. So multiple alleles means that there's not just a dominant and a recessive. There are several varieties of that one gene. So you just get two of them total. You get, you know, you get one from mom and one from dad and we're done. But there's several varieties that you could have gotten from mom and dad. That's multiple alleles. Polygenic means that there's more than one gene that determines this particular trait. So you could get one from mom, one from dad, another one from mom, another one from dad, another one from mom, another one from dad. Skin color, eye color, height, those are all classic examples of polygenic inheritance. Keep in mind that there's not just tall and short in human beings. We've got all these varieties of height. There's not just, um, there's not just blue eyes and brown eyes. There's not just light skin and dark skin. We've got all this rainbow of colors um, in eye color and in skin color, skin tone. Um, so let's just talk about it really quickly. This, um, I have seen maybe a simplistic, that it's even more complicated than what's um, implied in this diagram here. So in this diagram, they're saying it's not just one gene that determines the um, whether you produce melanin in your skin. Remember, melanin is what gives our skin color. It's also what gives our eye color. So the more melanin we have, the darker our skin color is. So the more, brown, more and more brown we have. So somebody, for example, with blue eyes is producing very little melanin in their eyes. Somebody with brown eyes is producing a lot. Somebody with pale skin is producing very little little melanin in their skin and somebody who's got um, very brown skin is producing a lot. And it's um, it totally is just how many of these genes you've inherited from your parents. So in this example, and, and I'm going to be very clear that skin color is complicated and I am oversimplifying it here. It is possible that skin color is incompletely dominant and not, they're show, in this example, they're showing it as pure dominant recessive just over several genes. Um, it is also possible that instead of just three genes, here they're showing you gene A, gene B, and gene C. I've seen stuff that indicates that it may be as many as six genes that are determining our skin color. So we're just giving you a very rough idea of how it could be so that you understand that um, some traits are not just one gene like Mendel um, made us believe. So let's take a look at this example right here. So in this case, we are crossing two parents that are very medium in terms of their skin color. So what that means is that this parent has inherited three dominant melanin genes, and this parent has inherited three dominant melanin genes. Um, the reason that this is really about incomplete dominance is that um, in that circumstance, this person should produce all melanin, and that's not the way it is. It's a blending. So it's it's more complicated, but just go with me for a second. So they also have three of the non-melanin producing genes. So that leads to an individual that is very um, medium skin toned. And this parent is also very medium skin toned, as medium as they can be in this simplistic example. But when they mate, they can produce babies that are an entire spectrum of browns. So if the babies receive 
um, from the one parent, the little a, the little b, the little c, which are for no melanin, and the little a, the little b, and the little c from the other parent, parent which is also no melanin, you're going to get a baby that is very, very, very fair-skinned. But if their baby instead happens to inherit all of the dominant genes and all of the dominant genes here, we're going to get a baby that has lots and lots of melanin in their skin. And so it's actually possible for parents who are more middle skinned color to produce an enormous variety of children that have various skin colors. Um, you might even want to Google um, fraternal twins, different races. Um, and you'll see that it is possible to have fraternal twins. So two children born at the same time, um, and one of whom is very, very fair skinned and one of whom is, um, is darker skinned. And that's because there's so much variation within the parents themselves. They have so much genetic diversity within themselves that their babies can be really genetic, genetically diverse. But now I want you to think about two parents that are super, super dark brown in color. So they have all, let's say they have all six, both of them have all six dominant melanin genes. Well, they're not going to produce a whole lot of variety within their offspring because they don't have a lot of variety in their, their melanin genes to produce a lot of variety. Likewise, if you have some parents that are missing all of the melanin genes, you're going to have families, you're going to have offspring that are all missing the melanin gene as well. So that's why we see um, in couples that are, are very light skinned or very dark skinned, very little diversity in their the skin color of their children. But in families where the parents are more middle level brown colors, we can see a huge rainbow of browns among their offspring. All right, and then how does this alter ratios? It alters ratios um, quite dramatically. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details here of how it alters the ratios, but you're just gonna have to trust me that it does. All right, and then next, complex interactions. Um, so the interactions among genes and the organism can be highly variable. This one is called pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is when one gene has multiple effects on the physiology of an organism. We are going to learn um, in quite depth um, about um, malaria. No, I should say that differently. We're going to learn about sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia produces lots and lots of different phenotypes within people who have um, sickle cell anemia. Perhaps the most important phenotype is that their, their red blood cells are sickle shaped. And so those red blood cells, unfortunately, when they're passing through the capillaries, um, because they have that sickle shape and the capillaries are only big enough to allow one blood cell through at a time, sometimes those red blood cells hook on each other, and then they clog the capillary. And then the blood can't get through. And that leads to what's called a sickle event. It can be extremely painful. It can lead to organ damage. It can lead to all kinds of troubles. Um, so that's sickle cell anemia. But there's many different um, phenotypes that go with sickle cell anemia because the gene affects several different um, tissue types within um, a human being. I'm trying to think if I can give you another example. Um, here's another example, um, Down syndrome. Down syndrome, we think of Down syndrome as something that um, has an impact on the central nervous system. So it leads to um, cognitive deficits. We're all clear on that. But, <clears throat> but um, Down syndrome also leads to, excuse me, <coughs> low set ears, um, a larger tongue, heart defects, hand um, anomalies, so just different looking hands than other people. Um, so those are all examples of multiple effects from this one particular genetic trait. We get, we see multiple effects. An interesting analogy might be, it's different, but an, an interesting analogy might be the multiple effects that we get from epinephrine or um, or adrenaline. Um, we learned in the last unit that adrenaline can have several effects because it affects different tissues and different receptors. It's a little bit different here, but just making that point. All right. And then the last one we're going to talk about in this set of notes is called epistasis. Epistasis is when two or more genes control the expression of one trait. The classic example that every biology textbook has um, has to do with laboratory retriever dogs. So the coat color in labs. 
it turns out that brown is dominant to, um, no, black is dominant to brown. So we refer to that gene as capital B and lowercase b. Capital B is for br um, black and lowercase b is the recessive brown trait. But there's another trait um, that is um, called the E allele. And in this case, the E allele determines whether the pigment is produced or not. And if a dog receives the recessive version, so two little eels, they're homozygous recessive for E, they don't produce the black or the brown trait. So then they show up as a yellow lab. Now, honestly, I don't know where white labs come from. I didn't have time to research that, so maybe you can research where white labs come from. Okay, so let's take a look at this particular Punnett square. Let's take a, oops, that is not what I wanted to do. There we go. Let's take a look at this particular Punnett square. So under normal circumstances, we're wondering, I, I want you to wonder, how does this affect the ratios? And I just want to show you here really quickly. In a normal dihybrid Punnett square, uh, we would expect that one out of 16 of these organisms, which are recessive and recessive, one out of 16 would show the light colored lab. It's um, gotten, no, it's not producing any of that particular, it's, it's the recessive all the way around. I, I don't know if I'm saying that very clearly. But instead, we see um, that these dogs that inherited a dominant trait they all look like the recessive dog that it was homozygous recessive. They all look alike. And so instead of the normal ratio that Mendel predicted, which was nine to three to three to one, we get a nine to three normal with the, the black and chocolate labs to four ratio. And that's because these two little E's prevent the release of the, um, the color um, trait. And so they end up all looking like yellow labs. All right. And then we'll do, I thought that, that was the last one. This is the last thing. So penetrance and expressivity. So penetrance is the likelihood of a genotype expressing a phenotype in an organism. So some traits penetrate more and some traits penetrate less. Um, expressivity is the extent to which a trait is expressed in an organism. So Down syndrome is a genetic condition with total penetrance. That means that it is once you get Down syndrome, you are 100% going to, once you inherit Down syndrome, you are 100% going to get Down syndrome. However, how it expresses itself is very varied. Um, if you know any folks with Down syndrome, we have a close family friend with Down syndrome, um, you know that their skill levels, their um, physical, their physical traits are extremely variable. And so that's high expressivity. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. There's, by the way, there's a lot more to say about Down syndrome. I'm super pumped to talk about Down syndrome because it is fascinating. Um, all right, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Have a great rest of your morning.